Oh, hi there. Don't mind me. Whoa. You may be wondering why I'm reviewing a film that came out 10 years ago. Well, The Golden Compass is based on a book called The Northern Lights, written by Philip Pullman. It's part of a trilogy called His Dark Materials. And with the announcement of Pullman's follow-up book, The Book of Dust, being released at the end of the year, I thought it would be fun to revisit this decade-old film. For those of you who don't know, it tells the story of Lyra Balacqua and her journey to rescue her kidnapped friend Roger. Along the way, she meets armoured bears, witches, and the despicable Oblation Board, intent on cutting away the souls of children. A lot can happen in 10 years. One can almost go through both high school and university without really even noticing. One can grow up and develop critical reasoning. And one can make two sequels to a successful film that enriched and enlightened both a franchise and a generation. Oh wait, sorry, I never developed critical reasoning. Why didn't this film succeed where the books flourished? Why was there no sequel? Who was to blame? And ultimately, was the film any good? It was New Line Cinema that brought us The Golden Compass. A surefire hit. With the release and massive success of Harry Potter's first adventures, and the recent Narnia adaptation, not to mention New Line's own phenomenal The Lord of the Rings, it seemed that New Line was about to strike gold once more. The Golden Compass would be the next big thing. It had everything going for it. This couldn't be simpler, thought New Line Cinema. An epic fantasy world, lovely talking animals, and plenty of polar bears and armour to sell toys of. There's only one problem. His Dark Materials is anything but simple. On the surface, The Golden Compass is still great. It has a host of great actors, from Ian McKellen to Nicole Kidman, and the visuals are damn good. But there's something lacking. Rewind the clock all the way back to the first trailer released by the studio, one thing becomes clear. Everything about the advertising, and even the way the film is made, screams The Lord of the Rings. And therein lies the first and fundamental problem. His Dark Materials is not The Lord of the Rings. Don't understand? I'll show you. We start the film with an absolute mammoth exposition dump. There are many universes, and many Earths, parallel to each other. Worlds like yours? where people's souls live inside their bodies. And worlds like mine, where they walk beside us, as animal spirits we call demons. So many worlds, but connecting them all is dust. Dust was here before the witches of the air, the Egyptians of the water, and the bears of the ice. In my world, Scholars invented an alithiometer, a golden compass, and it showed them all that was hidden. But the ruling power, fearing any truth but their own, destroyed these devices and forbade the very mention of dust. One compass remains, however, and only one who can read it. Ah, you'll never get me! <sighs> oh boy. Remember when I said it was trying to be the Lord of the Rings? Well, this sort of stuff is exactly what I'm talking about. Opening your film with a massive exposition dump is perfectly acceptable if the information is integral to the story and the world you are building. The audience will happily sit through this exposition if it means everything else will make sense. However, if the information is irrelevant or is repeated later, we as an audience will start to lose patience. Let's try the opening again. There are many universes and many Earths, parallel to each other. Worlds like yours, where people's souls live inside their bodies, and worlds like mine, where they walk beside us, as animal spirits we call demons. That's all you need. There are parallel universes, and in this universe, demons are a thing. That is setting the scene of the story. We don't need to know anything else at the moment. This stuff about the golden compasses is totally unnecessary. We don't need to know about them at the start of the movie. In fact, this information could have easily been given later when Lyra herself is given the alethiometer. As for the Magisterium, we have yet another force parallel to the Lord of the Rings. The Golden Compasses equal the Rings, and the Magisterium equals Sauron. 
I'm sure I'll end up saying this a lot throughout the course of the video, but it's for a good reason I promise. So in the books, the Magisterium and Dust are kept in the background as the plot to save the kidnapped Roger plays out. In terms of the bad guy, we have the Oblation Board, a specific branch of the Magisterium. They are intent on severing the link between human and demon. They believe that dust is evil, and since it only settles on humans after puberty, when a demon stops changing form and settles, if the human and demon were separated, then we could remain children forever, and would remain innocent and free of original sin. And yet while these motivations are grim, the focus is purely on the rescue of the children, as, for the most part, the motivations of the board are largely kept a mystery. In fact, some characters in the book say openly that dust is evil, and represents original sin. It's only at the end of the book, where Lyra openly renounces the Magisterium and declares Dust as good. Ultimately, it's part of her character arc to reject what she is told and form her own opinion. If they all think Dust is bad, it must be good. We've heard them all talk about Dust, and they're so afraid of it. And you know what? We believed them. Even though we could see that what they were doing was wicked and evil and wrong, we thought that Dust must be bad too, because they were grown-ups and they said so. But what if it isn't? What if it's... yeah. What if it's really good? At the start of the film, when Lord Asriel talks about evidence he's found for a city in the stars, a parallel universe, it is a man from the Magisterium that attempts to poison him to prevent the research into dust. In the books, we have the Master of Jordan College poisoning him in order to protect Lyra from what Asriel might do one day. Now, while I do sort of agree with this specific change, as the Master's motivations are possibly too complicated for a film and work better in the book, it's a perfect example of a conscious change to simplify both the Magisterium and the character of the Master of Jordan College. In the film, all these choices and decisions are boiled down to a paragraph, a bit like what I did in this review, and I bet it wasn't as engaging as the book. Unfortunately, the film is more interested in setting up the lore than what's actually happening. Watching this film, you sometimes feel a sense of aimlessness. The reason being, the film sort of forgets it's about kidnapped children, to the point that it swaps the sequence at Bolvanger, the base of the kidnappers, and the sequence at the Armored Bear's Palace. In the books, Bolvanger is first, followed by the Armored Bear's Palace. The film has them swapped. One could say it was so that the big battle would happen at the end of the movie. But the cynic in me thinks that it's because they forgot that they were meant to rescue some children, and instead got distracted by two polar bears punching each other. New Line were in such a hurry to remake The Lord of the Rings, I think they sort of forgot what the Northern Lights is about. And I swear they just reused old footage from The Lord of the Rings. The Golden Compass and The Lord of the Rings do share a lot in common. They are both high fantasy, and at the end of the day are quest stories. But the movie just misses the mark. His dark material strengths were not just the world, but the small nuances and details about the characters and the story. Its deeper meanings and metaphorical commentary. It all sounds a bit pretentious when you write it down like that. But the film turned the world building into homework by forcing it down our throats. And as for more subtle meanings, well, they're all but gone. Trying to be something it's not and forcing the lore of the world upon us? Is this what's to blame for the film? Well, maybe. But I think there's more to it. His Dark Materials is an epic story that takes its characters through multiple worlds and universes and tackles themes of loss of innocence, faith, love, death, and freedom. And that's just to name a few. Lyra and her co-lead, Will Parry, who is introduced in the second book, experience many tragedies and triumphs. They discover what dust really means, they travel to the world of the dead, and they meet God. It all seems incredible when you think about it in comparison to the film, or even the first book itself. And yet these seemingly impossible events fit into the story perfectly due to a slow but purposeful build-up through the first two books. Unfortunately, the film rushed its source material, and ended coming across as a visual representation of a Wikipedia article about the book. Plot points, characters and events are replaced by bullet points on a list with no passion or soul put into them. The film has, in my opinion, simplified the book's story to the point that it is no longer special. Whether it's depicting the Magisterium as irredeemable insect people, or reducing the Egyptians from a proud, noble people shunned by the world to what were effectively just pirates. Oh, and did I mention how criminally short this film is? It's only 114 minutes! Now, I know it's not that short for a film, but for an epic, that is really short. It's baffling to think that while a lot was done to make this film like Lord of the Rings, the runtime wasn't one of them. Each Lord of the Rings is three hours, with The Return of the King about three hours and 20 minutes. Even the first Harry Potter was two and a half hours, and that had a comparatively simple storyline. 
At a little under two hours, this film didn't stand a chance. They could have had at least another half hour to expand the characters and story. It's a vicious cycle. The running time was too short, so the exposition must be compressed and the characters and world simplified. It truly is a shame. The books brought us a fantastic story. This film brought us a story told in bullet points. The book introduced us to the characters we felt deeply for. The film introduced us to board game counters with faces stuck on. And the book showed us scenes that made us cry, laugh and sing. The film showed us scenes that made us want to go, oh wait, was that the end? And so finally we make it to the ending of the film. After the defeat of the Oblation Board at Bolvanger, Lyra and Roger, along with Yorick Bjornesson and one of my favourite characters, Lee Scoresby, travel to the far north to meet Lord Asriel. The pair of children reflect on their victory and what needs to be done next. Lee Scoresby speaks to the witch Seraphina Pecola, who tells him of the coming war that Lyra is to be a part of. Then the movie ends. Except, that's only about three quarters of the book. There's more. In the books! The children arrive at Lord Azriel's research facility. Lyra is under the impression she must give Azriel the alethiometer, as it told her she was bringing him what he needs. Upon arrival, Azriel is shocked and refuses, until he sees Roger. He welcomes them in and gives them food and a bed. But in the middle of the night, Lyra is awoken by Azriel's manservant. He's taken the boy. Azriel has taken Roger. Lyra rushes to save Roger. What does Azriel intend to do? Under the Northern Lights, Azriel intends to separate Roger from his demon. Like splitting an atom, this creates a massive amount of energy. And Azriel will use this to tear a hole in the sky and walk through to the parallel world. Lyra tries, but fails. The sky is opened, and Roger is dead. Lyra and Pantalaimon are alone. But as I said earlier, they renounce the Magisterium and set out to find dust. With that, Lyra and Pan step forward into the new world. Many films change the endings of their source material, especially if you want a cliffhanger so that people will watch the sequel. The thing is, they already had the perfect ending. Why did you decide to cut it? This film has cut and cut its source material until there's almost nothing left. Cutting the real finale, coupled with a final battle shot almost in the dark, with uninspiring action, causes everything you've been working on up until now to be anticlimactic. There's no payoff if you simply just stop in the middle of the sentence. Thank you so much for watching. Any comments or likes would be amazing. This was part one of two, so if you found it interesting and would like to know more, then subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. Next time we'll be talking about what happened behind the camera and the production history that led to the failure of not just this franchise, but had a profound effect on not just one but two more franchises and ultimately led to the fall of an entire film studio. So yeah, pretty crazy stuff. And with that, I'll say goodbye.